Well, hi, Tom. It is such a pleasure to have you join us all the way from London today. And um, I want to introduce you to uh, the folks who are watching today during our um, 2023 Festival of Wales is when we will be airing this. And um, Tom has had an incredible career as a uh, a photographer, a a dolphin or a cetacean researcher, a dolphin and whale researcher, um, a videographer. Uh, he has participated in the making of a number of films. He's written a book most recently, "How to Speak Whale," and which was such a provocative title. Um, and Tom also has um, something in his history that may many of you may have seen and not realized that it was Tom. And so, uh, Tom, I'm going to share this with everyone in just a minute or two. But why don't you go ahead and say hello and tell us how it's going over there in London today? Um, thank you, Giselle. Um, I, it's lovely to join you. Thanks very much for uh, dropping by uh, in London. It is almost like Los Angeles kind of weather or like. Californian weather. <laughs> uh, so I'm just uh, basking in this sunlight. Uh, Wonderful. Yes. Well, we're happy for you. I know that doesn't happen very much in the wintertime. So uh, no. that's terrific. Um, <laughs> Well, your book, um, which I had the opportunity to listen to in the last week since we set this up, is really fascinating. But before we get to that, um, I kind of the, the, the theme for this year's um, interview series is um, to be an eco hero. So I'm connecting with you uh, because I think you are an eco hero. And someone to me who is an eco hero is someone who has raised the consciousness of the public by changing something, doing something, learning something, sharing something, and making a difference in the world of particularly in our case, dolphins and whales. And that's, um, you know, being what we do here so in Dana Point, uh, the dolphin and whale watching capital of the world. So um, in London, tell me what whale watching and dolphin watching is like. It, what, what it's like here in the UK? Uh-huh. Oh, it's so much worse than in the States, sadly, because our protections are far worse. I mean, we, um, it's probably comparable to some parts of the east coast of the US where there were historically a lot of whales and dolphins but because of the whaling industry and the other exploitation of the sea and the high marine traffic um, it's very troubled I mean most in London uh, we had a beluga swim up the Thames we had another whale swim up the Thames a few years ago um, I think it was a bottlenosed whale and then we you know, we have sperm whales off the coast, minke whales, humpback whales. We've got a population of uh, orca of Scotland. Uh, they sometimes come down. Um, we've got lots of other marine mammals. We have, uh, we had a walrus pop by the other day uh, and, and hauled out in Scarborough. Um, we have the, on one side of the British Isles, we have a very shallow sea, the North Sea. And so there aren't so many whales and dolphins there, but we have the Atlantic coast on the other side with the deep water and I've been out in the sea halfway between Wales and Ireland, and we've had megapods of um, common dolphin, North Atlantic striped dolphin, uh, all kinds of um, cetaceans. And, uh, and, and they're sort of returning a bit, it feels. It's unclear whether climate change is changing the sea, so they're moving because they're forced, or because the conservation is, is working and they're able to return to areas they previously okay. lived in. But the sad thing, is even though we've got all these cetaceans, these whales and dolphins, most people here have no idea. And there isn't really oh, much of a whale watching industry. Uh, and, and obviously, as you know, every, where there's a whale watching industry, then there's people looking out for whales right. and making sure they're okay. Um, in the channel at the moment, we have mega trawlers hoovering up huge, you know, with, where each net is the size of four jumbo jets. And wow. associated with that, the bodies of dolphins that have been bycatch, uh, which have been caught uh, and killed in these nets, wash ashore every year. But so it's, I would say we are behind you guys uh, here. And it's really sad because we don't need to be. Uh, we could have a flourishing ecosystem and people get to getting to enjoy that too. Yeah. 
Well, I agree with you in your book, and um, which was really resonated with us, um, as I was sharing. You know, our our tagline at Captain Dave's is "Experience the connection," because mm -hmm. we believe that once you come out and you have this eye to eye encounter. In fact, the boat behind me is the one with the underwater viewing pods. There's no other boat like it in the mm -hmm. world. Right below the surface of the water here are these two compartments that Dave put into the hull, they're just bulletproof glass. So you can get down there one or two people at a time and you can have this eye to eye experience mm -hmm. with dolphins and um, have a connection. You can have the same connection very similarly from the, the front of the boat where you're looking down through the nets because as you know, um, dolphins love to come and they turn and they look at you. And they're like, oh, what are you? You know, mm -hmm. or I know what you are. What are you going to do? What are you going, mm -hmm. are you going to make a noise? We, there's all kinds of interactions that we've witnessed. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go back a little bit to young Tom um, because I have a theory and I love to test it. So Tom, when was the first time you remember having a connection with some kind of wild creature and thinking oh, yeah i i ask I myself this this question quite a lot because i don't know as, when you try and really push back into your own memory the order of events is kind of unclear i know i mean we had pet cats so i'm not sure if you'd call them wild creatures but being around them and, you know, seeing their, like looking, I think for me, it's often about these tiny details, like looking through the eyeball of the cat and seeing its iris and its pupil were different shaped and they and the flecks of pigment in them. Yeah. Um, but what I, I think, and then I remember when I was really small, lying in the grass of our back garden and, you know, when your face is just in the grass, these aren't really experiences where things happened. But it was more like you just feel within this other world and the little ants walking up the blades of grass and you suddenly you can look through it and you realize that there's just this universe that you're not normally aware of. I remember coming across a, a, a duck on her eggs in a little woodland and um, suddenly spotting her because she was so well camouflaged and feeling very... Um, feeling a bit naughty almost because I didn't want to disturb her but also kind of spellbind by how beautiful it was and how precious it was um I, but then I think I mean the earliest experience that I can remember as a kind of story was a really bad negative one in that I was a little boy and I was playing with um a model electric railway when I, I must have been four at most and I got a beetle from the garden I wanted to put it on the track and squish it with the train to see what would happen and and my dad came in and he looked down and he said um he was a judge and he didn't tell me off he just said um you know you, you've got to understand that what you're doing is is your choice and I felt very ashamed and I felt and I put took the beetle back into the garden I didn't didn't squish it but I think that was a very important moment for me because yeah he didn't like tell me off, you know, he, he, he really just gave me an understanding of my own agency and that these other animals had their own life. And it was down to me what happened to them. Yeah. And I think when you're a very small person, you're used to being able to get away with anything and not be responsible to other lives. So that I think was quite formative to me. Um, that's a powerful story and it's so symbolic of like our lives in so many yeah. ways is that we do have choices hmm. um you know whether it's um how, how we choose to 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 be conservationists you know personal con or citizen conservationists or maybe we are plant-based um or perhaps you know so that we don't have a role in in the fishing um gear and net um death i one of the things dave and i have tried to do and for i'm going to repeat it again because it can never be said enough is that nearly a thousand dolphins and whales are dying in fishing gear and nets around the world every day 
And that is um, straight from a NOAA report here in the US. And someone told me that that number's actually gone up. They've updated the report. I've requested that, that I haven't seen it yet. So nevertheless, you know, that's a lot of animals. And that is, and I, I can't even imagine the other bycatch, right? The birds and the uh, sea turtles and mm. the um, sea lions and, elephant seals and mm. the list goes on and on so um there's a lot of ways we can do it but it starts with we have a choice mm. and um just because we see something doesn't mean it has to stay that way um you you mentioned uh something really important at the beginning and that was that um you know what in your book you know what we um you quoted i think it's we protect what we um, or we inconvenience ourselves for what we know. We don't inconvenience ourselves for what we don't know. And some of the stories that you shared were just heartbreaking and hard, hard to, you know, it's like, oh, because in ignorance, um, humans have done a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And um, the good news, though, is I really feel as though as a, as a, as, as a point in human history, we are finally turning a corner and saying, wow. And I think a lot of that has to do with people who aren't just traditional scientists mm -hmm. like you, like us, like countless other thousands of people out there who might actually just be out there with a phone mm -hmm. and- Type and and taking video of something that happens and everyone else saying i didn't know that or you know i suspected that that might be the case or wow that it, it changes things and so we begin to know animals differently and then care differently and i would love to, i hope and pray that you know the uk as because you're in such a rich um uh ecosystem there that that awareness does continue to increase and that's you know part of what we're trying to do here with just letting people know what's right off our coast is mm -hmm. is this dave calls it a living breathing moving um serengeti you know mm -hmm. it's like it's but it's off the coast and because it's under the ocean we don't always know that it's there but mm. there nevertheless you know um it's happening so um can I share another part of your journey now? I'm going to share my screen and let's share with everyone a very, uh, we don't recommend this <laughs> as a way to meet, um, to meet uh, uh, a humpback whale, right? I'm going to go ahead and share this, Tom. Here we go. All right. So this is you. And this was how many years ago now? It was in 2015, so seven years ago. If they're going to replay this again. It's just a short video. There is your little head popping up. That's right. With Charlotte, right? Your friend Charlotte. Yeah. Wow. Charlotte. Yeah. Amazing wow. that you guys survived this experience. Yes. Wow. Um... Chilling. <laughs> and um, just... Uh, Oof. So um, incredible. Um, so so that moment that you experienced this, um, you mentioned in the book that you know you're looking up at this animal and it sees you, obviously hadn't seen you up until that point. We mm -hmm. have a, a, a rule here. You never shut your engines off. Yeah. We you're were, in neutral, yeah. right? But you're making mm -hmm. noise because particularly, yeah. you know, whales, they don't eco-locate. They don't, I, we, you know, we're not sure what different mechanisms they use for navigation, but mm -hmm. making noise is a good thing. Um, yeah. So they know where you are. And you're yes. in a kayak. You're probably holding your breath. <laughs> Because well, it's well, yeah. so incredible. I mean, we so we've been whale watching in Monterey Bay, so just up, you know, the coast from you guys. And um, we were in a tour and on our way back to the harbor when that happened. And we'd been trying to make noise too. So we've been like the whole time like drumming on the hull with our fingers of the kayak. So any humpbacks around would know we were there. But I guess 
once once a whale is a humpback whale is propelling itself into a breach maybe over the sound of all the water rushing past sure it, and and uh, you know the visibility there it's the water's full of green life so you can't see through it very clearly um but yeah it it, it did a full breach and um you know I, it 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 was you know as you can imagine pretty spectacular um and sort of unreal you know because suddenly there was and there wasn't very much sound it just went like and then there was a you know 30 40 ton well above us coming down onto us and um it uh afterwards we figured it out it's it 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 was going to land on top of us but then it turned and changed the motion of its of its jump so scientists who analyzed the video showed how it was doing a kind of breach like that but it kind of went and arced itself away and because it decided not to land on us which I should say is not necessarily because it liked us. It might just be because it thought we looked uncomfortable. Um, it didn't land. <laughs> to hit, didn't land. yeah. It was like, hit, I don't right? want to hit a kayak. Yeah, I like who does? Yeah. yeah, so it doesn't necessarily, although yeah. there is a lot of evidence for humpback whales behaving altruistically yes. towards other species. So it's yes. an open question. Yes. Um, and um, because it turned away, it, it it hit us with its pec fin, you know, which is still the biggest arm ever in the natural world. So. And that that smashed into the nose of the kayak, and we turned the kayak over, and it smashed into us with its body parallel to the kayak and its arm hitting the nose, and that pulled us all underwater. And it, it was like a couple of centimeters from Charlotte's feet, and the whole nose of the kayak was all squished in. And then we were in the water underwater, and obviously there's a lot of turbulence when a, you know, yeah. I think there was one study that calculated the force in a breach is equivalent to sort of thirty hand grenades. So it, it it was a we were kind of whirled around and I, I was convinced, you know, that I was broken and in pieces and was going to shortly be in lots of pain or die. And I was sure that Charlotte was dead. And then I swam back up to the surface and we were both totally unharmed. So a miracle. It really, yeah, it really. And, and there were so many strange, lucky elements to it, you know that it was lucky that it happened. It was lucky that somebody was turned away from the, because most of the humpbacks were out to sea. So the person who filmed that was actually looking the wrong way. They were wow. actually filming away from the humpbacks towards the land um, or to, you know, sideways as we were going towards the land. And, and then all of these new scientific tools came out that allowed scientists to use that video to identify the whale and, and that kind of led me into just becoming fascinated by, you know, I had a fleeting interaction with a wild animal. And now since that's happened, so many of these AI tools have come out so that we can all learn more about the animals around us and see them as individuals. Yeah. And as a conservationist, like my background, I was trained as a zoologist. And before I went into wildlife film and writing, I, I it, it, it just, you, you you wouldn't be able to learn this much about other species and see them as individuals. And now you and I, and I, you know, I, I went to the park with my daughter, who's two, and we used my phone to ID all the trees and I, and all the birds by their songs. And, you know, like you, I'm sure, you know, do you use happy whale? The... We do. And we contribute yeah. to happy whale all the time. So that's a great citizen science tool. I am a huge lover of Merlin. Um, which is a fabulous, if anyone's watching, a fabulous bird identif identifier. I just absolutely love that thing. I, I use it four or five times a day uh, mm -hmm. where we live. Um, there's just some really cool birds. Dave and I moved out more towards the mountains um, a couple of years ago. We still are at the coast, obviously, for the business um, on a daily basis, but almost daily basis. But just being out in the wild and, mm -hmm. you know, being able to experience that with this phenomenal, at uh, least phenomenal AI tools. Mm -hmm. So going back to the, how to be an eco hero, um, your, your, your journey was non-traditional. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of science out there. And I love, I love the book in terms of, of, boiling down for me, just a regular person, um, some of the more um, 
uh, heady information and and papers and research and all of that, and you make it very understandable. Um, so how to speak whale, let's talk about that. Um, I'll share really quick the uh, cover of the book. There it is, How to Speak Whale, Tom Mustel, A Voyage into the Future of Animal Communication. So uh, Tom, let's get into the book a little bit. Um, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading. And for those of you who are looking, you can get it on Amazon, uh, How to Speak Whale, A Voyage into the Future of Animal Communication. And um, so I have a quick uh, story to tell because you were talking about uh, many instances of this. Back in the day when we first launched the boat behind me, we had the underwater viewing pod. And when we decided, wow, this is such a big hit, everyone loved to be down in it and hear the animals eco-locating through the, the glass or to have this eye-to-eye -eye experience, we decided to put a second one in. And Dave thought, hey, let's have some fun with it. Let's call it the X-Pod for exper experimentation. And so he had a keyboard down there where people could, and he had some pre-recorded sounds, just, you know, fun things, human sounds. But he also, one of the buttons was a humpback whale uh, singing. And so a person could go down there and just have some fun and beep, 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 you know, play whatever they wanted. And on the very first day that we did this, and we see humpbacks on a semi-regular basis. Um, we hadn't been seeing any for several days. And someone gets down in the pod, the X pod, and they start pushing the humpback whale sound and it's singing. And within minutes, a humpback whale comes out of nowhere, right up to the boat. Like what, what's happening in there? And we're like, what? So we got it on video and we just thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and then of course we were like, wait, I don't think this is a good idea because now we are impacting, you know, the behavior of these animals. And that's not what we're in the business of doing. You know, we're, we're here to just observe and um, have some fun with them and, and not, you know, to in any way, shape or form uh, impact or change their behavior. So we had to stop uh, doing that and uh, had a little chat with our NOAA officials about how we would not be doing that anymore. <laughs> but um, wow. clearly, it, I mean, it, 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 it seemed to us, clearly they responded to the sound. So mm. um, talk, if you, if you would, um, besides the AI apps that mm -hmm. we can all access to identify plants and flowers and um, birds, mm -hmm. tell me about what's going on with SETI. Can you introduce that to the folks who are watching and, and what um, they're doing to perhaps reach out to other species that are right here? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'll just sort of build up to it for a moment. That, sure. So in, in trying to, you know, for a long time, there's sort of a few hurdles to trying to speak to another animal. Um, one is whether we think they might speak themselves if they don't communicate um, in a way that's complicated and like language, we wouldn't be able to have a conversation. But fortunately, you know, we've, with whales and dolphins, like over the last 50 or 60 years, we've realized that, you know, instead of being sort of stupid big fish, as most people thought of them in the middle of the last century, they are highly sophisticated uh, animals that can live for a long time, many of them in social groups. Um, they have big, really complicated brains uh, that were uh, captive dolphins have shown us that uh, they have uh, advanced cognitive capacities so they can think they can think about things happening in the future they can learn uh, communication systems that we teach them they can manipulate those communication systems to come up with new terms solve problems um, so uh, and then in the wild when we record them we see that they're having these really complicated sort of vocal interactions I hesitate from saying conversations because we don't know that for sure but it would be weird if they weren't because they go to enormous lengths they've got 
a very uh, virtuoso voices. Um, their ability to make sounds and listen to sound is very high. And they spend a lot of their time making and listening to sounds. Um, so that gives us a, a sort of evidence that there's someone there to talk to. Um, helpfully, they're also quite inquisitive, many species and lots of individuals, as you'd have seen, you know, that they don't just avoid people. Sometimes you have friendly humpback whales that come and check boats out. Sometimes cetaceans make friends with each other across the species barrier. So there's already an interspecies like inquisitiveness within many of them, which is helpful because if they didn't want anything to do with us, it would be also hard to interact. Um, another hurdle is that most people, it's taken a long time even for mainstream science to uh, accept that perhaps other species might be able to do things that we do, like think in complicated ways about their individualness and about others, feel deep, complex emotions um, and speak. And, but that's changing in our culture. So all those things have, have set the scene, really. We, we, we know that they have complex communications. They, some species might even have names for themselves and, 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 and far more complicated things than that. Um, and we think they're, uh, we, we don't think they're stupid. And they, some of them are interested in us, but the biggest hurdle once you get past all of them is how do you uh, listen to them? How do you get enough of their communications that you can start to find patterns in them and decode their communications? Um, humans can't go in the sea. We don't work very well underwater. Our hearing isn't very good. We can't see very far. We get cold, we drown, we can't keep up with them. Um, and when we jump in, often we disturb them. So we're messing up trying to listen to their wild conversations. But now we have um, robots and static listening devices that can listen in on their conversations for years and years without disturbing them. So we can get these data sets. And what's really exciting is these, we can get big data sets. So most of the data sets we've had so far are quite small. Um, now um, there's Project SETI and other projects are putting, um, are trying to get what uh, almost like a sort of industrial scale listening in on the natural world. And industrial scale doesn't mean that there's heavy industry that's messing it up. It's more that many of the tools that we've devised in the last 10 years um, for analyzing data require huge amounts of data, what's called big data. So um, the tools that analyze the shape of your face and find patterns in it that help you sort your photos on Facebook or your iPhone into different people, uh, the app that you're, you use to transcribe your meeting notes. And all of these uh, are AI tools that find patterns and the patterns, the, the more data they're fed, the more sophisticated they become at finding patterns. And that's really exciting in language because Google Translate relies on a lot of AI processes that find patterns in human languages. And you can translate between one language in like say English and Urdu or Swahili uh, using Google Translate if because it's been fed enough examples of lots and lots of different human conversations and language, it can see patterns in that that no human can perceive. And it can use those patterns it's found to match them to patterns between languages and translate between languages without using a dictionary. And that is what a lot of people are getting really excited now in biology is that we can't see patterns in animal languages easily. Even if we can record them, we, we, we would take us hundreds of lifetimes to listen in on every single um, recording we make. And we're trapped in our human ideas of language, how we speak to one another. You know, all the way that we, you and I are talking, I'll say like, oh, can't you see, visualize this? You know, we're very visual. Uh, we map all of our experiences and our way of thinking and speaking onto this visual world. But whales and dolphins, they primarily, um, we think, use sound to explore their world and perhaps also to conceptualize their world. So we're trapped in our human brains and our human lives, and that stops us from seeing patterns in, um, in other species. And now we have these AI tools and the ability to get large enough amounts of information to, to present to those AI tools. And now the AI tools are gonna to be applied to try and show us patterns in the communications of whales and dolphins. And Project SETI is leading the charge. They are doing a project in Dominica uh, in the Caribbean 
um, at the moment where they're trying to get the largest ever data set of any animal communications. They have static hydrophones floating in the sea within the home range of this uh, of these sperm whale pods and sperm whales. Um, they're a, a, actually a, a very large dolphin. They're a dontocete. Um, and they hunt giant squids and they live in very tightly enmeshed social groups. Um, they rely totally on communicating with, with one another uh, to survive. They have to teach each other how to hunt, how to protect each other, how to care for their young. Um, they, uh, they have very different communications within their different social groups, so much so that scientists think organize them into acoustic clans where different whales and different sperm whale like groups, they might look the same to us and live in the same sea, but it's as if they're different people. Uh, so different languages and like different cultures. So speaking is very important to these whales. I say speaking because we don't really know what it is that they're communicating and if there's meaning in it, but it'd be weird if there wasn't. Why, why else would they do it? Right. Um, so because there's a biologist there called Shane Jiro, who's been studying those whales for a long time, they know all of the social dynamics of the whales. So it's very important if you're eavesdropping on a conversation to know who's speaking, to know what their backstory is, to know who else is around and what the context of those communications are. Is there a storm? Is there a predator coming that's threatening them? Are there loads of things to eat? Are there rivals? Is it a mother talking to a baby or is it a grandparent talking to a son? They have a, sorry, a grandson they haven't seen for five years. All of these bits of metadata help to inform the analysis. And that's what this project is trying to do. They're not only trying to get eavesdrop on more conversations than ever before to feed into the pattern finding engines. They're trying to place that within the context of the lives of these animals. And really it's the first like sort of proper attempt to take what has previously been an anecdotal science, uh, which is the study of animal communications mainly just observed by one person or a few people one after another after another because we couldn't do anything else and take it into a paradigm shift where we take these ai tools that can be used for awful things controlling and coercing people and spying on us but can also be used for showing people who care about nature things that we would overlook or be unable to see and i think that's like one of the most exciting things in the world if not the most exciting thing for me because you know we've these animals have been talking to each other in the seas for far longer potentially than we've been talking to each other on the land we have no idea what they're saying we have no idea about their lives their mysteries but we're giving them the time of day like and we're applying these resources to giving ourselves an insight into them i love it i love it it's so exciting and um i really appreciate you know someone making it uh understandable to uh, the average person, Jane or, or Joe. So I know that uh, your time is limited, but I, I'd like to kind of ask you, um, there's a lot of ways to um, uh, get involved in this yes. kind of thing, right? So um, everything from uh, being a researcher, and going along a more traditional track to perhaps um, bridging between two, you know, film and uh, uh, photos and mm. maybe sound and maybe someone's got, you know, a, a real desire to do uh, sound engineering or something like that. There's IT stuff. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's huge. There's a lot of ways to contribute to this and to just take part in it, right. With the different yeah. AI tools. Um, how, how would you, as you raise children, um, you have one or one and the second, hopefully if I, in June. Oh, congratulations. That's Thank very you. exciting. Uh, so as you raise children, how mm. how do you speak into their lives and encourage them to be um, eco heroes themselves? To those of us who are out here, we're not, you know, we're not scientists. We're not going to go back to school, um, but we want to make a difference in mm. the, in the lives of perhaps it's dolphins and whales, perhaps it's land animals, you know, perhaps it's birds. Uh, it could be mm. um, just 
caterpillars you know there's a whole thing mm. going on here with the monarch caterpillars so tell me um what what are your thoughts oh i've got a lot um well i guess i mean if you already have a passion for nature and you're wondering how you can contribute you know human beings are a diverse group of individuals and no one skill or no one approach is is going to fix everything so don't feel overwhelmed because what you can't see a way that you can fix everything because no one can all you can do is what you're most interested in and most able to and we have different interests and abilities so the first thing would be just to do what's in front of you and if you don't know what that is not to panic uh, and follow your sense of wonder um i think the more interest you take in an animal or an ecosystem just following your curiosity will lead you to seeing ways that it struggles and ways that you could help um with this ai example is one of the reasons i find it very interesting is it's the use of developing ai to help nature is bringing in loads of people who would not normally feel that they're allowed to be part of exploring nature I don't feel anyone should gatekeep um, who's allowed to experience a sense of natural wonder. And it also isn't an exotic thing. It doesn't need to happen far away. It can happen, you know, there's that nature is all around you and inside you yeah. oh, and you are part of nature. Yeah. So I guess partly it's sort of to not panic and then do what you think you'll enjoy. You know, computer programmers who've never seen whales have designed the best algorithms for identifying them and classifying their speech. That's pretty cool. You know, um, you don't have to go out, but if you want to go out and you don't know what you want to do, just spend time and enjoy yourself. I think to your other question about young people and how you foster a sense of kind of eco, you know, love or heroism in them, they are already eco heroes. I think humans are born with a natural inquisitiveness about the natural world because it's really interesting. And I see this in my daughter. I go outside. I mean, Rachel Carson, the great Rachel Carson, who wrote many books, you know, like Silent Spring and about terrible human things. She also wrote a tiny little book called The Sense of Wonder, which was about taking, I think he was four year old. Was it her grandson or her nephew out for walks and just she would just try and hold herself back from telling him what they were seeing and try and follow his innate curiosity. Because as we grow up, we get very interested in categorizing things and deciding what should be where. But little people um, don't necessarily have to leap to that immediately. And so she found herself entranced with seeing the world again through his eyes. And we all naturally start out interested in the living world the process of growing up is also for many people a process of being told that either that is childish and they should focus on more adult things which i think is a great shame um or that it's not for them and that they should stick to stay in their lane which i think is also a great shame so uh, i don't think you need to work to help young people l l relish the, the living world and feel part of it you can in a way just follow their lead just give them the chance to lead I love that. I love that, that no one should decide, you know, or be the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is open to one and all. And that if we could all be uh, in the, in the words of, you know, uh, Jesus, let's all just be like little children. I think the mm. life would probably go a lot better um, if we yeah. had that sense of wonder and appreciation for you know everything around us um then we would all be true you know eco heroes and, yeah it would be unavoidable uh, exactly. <laughs> i guess it's our preoccupations and social ambitions that get in the way um you know if i i walk past a tree and if its flowers are out i'm not going to notice that if i'm worried about my to do list or my preoccupation is you know, whether someone's getting one over me or what I ought right. to be doing next. Right. But, you know, it's the classic thing, you know, to wake up and smell the roses. You know, I don't think it's a, it's a surprise that in that expression, it's a, a living, beautiful, wonderful thing that you're supposed to experience. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah.
Thank you, Tom, so much for those wise words. I really appreciate it. And on your next visit to California, please put Dana Point on your list of spots to stop at. Try and stop me. You've got <laughs> megapods. How many did you say? How many kinds? Like in dolphins? Right. So oh, I said okay. we have over 450,000 in common dolphin alone. We see five species of dolphin throughout the year. And common dolphin is um, the most uh, that we see. And we see megapods of 2,000 or more on a mm. very regular basis. And in fact, if you're interested, I know, look up dolphin stampedes and you'll see at the very top, pretty much uh, most, if, if not all of your top 10 are going to be from, from Dana Point, California. Um, it's phenomenal to wow. see a, a you know a pot of dolphin and i'll finish with something that dave always has said and this is kind of what got us into year-round dolphin and whale watching back in the 90s which is you know there is no other wild animal on the planet that when they see you they turn and they come racing towards you in great herds not to be fed and not to eat you but to play mm. and just have some kind of connection and maybe for them it's a just play connection maybe it's deeper i don't know but when they come and they race towards you it's such a thrill to see them coming and circling the boat and then joining with you in moving in the same direction mm -hmm. some of them for a ride some of them just to jump and i think show off <laughs> i don't know what they're doing but they're i was just I it's I so would, I would, I would say like, I would remove all the justs from that, you know, because if you've managed to stay alive on this planet and evolve into such a graceful and effective marine predator, that you've got yeah. enough spare time to spend it jumping and playing. Maybe yeah. that's the point of life. Maybe it's not just <laughs> jumping or playing, but like, you know, maybe that's ultimately the goal is to be able to to have the time to jump and play. Yes, um, let's yeah. all jump and play a little more. Right, isn't See, that like what children? people think yeah. about with retirement? Like <laughs> dolphins, just they get it. They just don't wait till they're you know two thirds through life. Yeah. Exactly, I love it. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> and um, I really encourage everyone to pick up a copy of How to Speak Well and or listen to it on Audible. It's excellent, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Giselle.